Hello and welcome again. Today we're going to talk about the basics of recovery. Uh, I'm a big believer that your life needs to be balanced. And of course, I've often discussed what I learned in the second grade from Sister Maria Sumta, where she put a chart up on the board that went work, rest, play, and pray, with pray being all kinds of things, including meditation and time alone in nature. And it could simply for some of you just be reading a book uh, that isn't in your field, something fun. Well, the more balanced your life is and the more balance you get your training, I think the easier and easier recovery becomes. At the same time, a lot of times of the year, a lot of times in a career, you really have to go after, I used to call it the big push. Uh, I would write in my journal every year, now starts the big push. But it was usually about three week periods. It wasn't 52 week periods. So let's get to the basics of recovery. And honestly, as I said right there at the top, this is it. I mean, there's nothing fancy here. Um, first and foremost, and I can't say this enough ever, it's sleep, folks. It's sleep. You have got to have quality sleep. Uh, I always tell people that how much I invest in good sleep. Uh, if you visit me in my home, you'll find that I spent a lot of money on shutters throughout my entire home. Uh, our bedrooms are very dark at night. We keep our temperature low. Uh, I talk my wife when it gets down to 67. I would prefer 62. Um, but that's okay. Somewhere in the 60s in Fahrenheit is where you'd want to be. <sighs> should be quiet. Uh, you should probably do a to-do list a couple of hours before you go to bed just to get a lot of that nonsense out of your brain. I think that's very helpful. It's one of my key uh, keys to my pirate map. Um, boy, it would be nice to not watch television or look at screens right before you go to bed. But I get it. That's a, fo a form of entertainment. Reading a good book might be better. Some people find hot baths helpful before they go to bed. Oddly, I find cold showers very good before I go to bed. And I found that to be true with other people. Um, I have a, a headband with earphones that I wear on the road that uh, is Bluetooth to uh, brain.fm so that I can sleep when I'm on the road and have that um, the sleep music, inducing music in my head. Oh boy, there's so many things. Now, I buy those magic pajamas that supposedly help you. I know the research, there is no research on them and I doubt they work. But, you know, I think they might work so it helps me sleep, especially when I'm on the road. And if you do have to travel on the road a lot, I would suggest, if you sleep in a lot of motels, to always wear sleepwear. And I don't want to explain in great detail why. Number two, and this is read it out, the body is one piece. Uh, if you're having massive stressors in your family life, in your social life, in your personal life, in your business life, it's going to have a huge impact on your training. The body is one piece. If you have a tooth infection, it's going to hurt your squatting day. If you have an ear infection, as I've had many times in my career, it's going to kill any kind of movement you do. The body is one piece. The body is one piece. The body is one piece. I always tell everybody, look at the Lees, emotionally, physically, socially. Um, throw in every Lee you can think of. Those all impact your recovery. So always make sure you sit back and look at your whole life before you invest in something to help your recovery. Um, getting out of a terrible relationship, boss, uh, other relationships, might be more helpful for your recovery than all the magic voodoo in the world. Number three, I feel strongly about this point. If you don't think about your recovery, you won't. You've got to spend some time daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, looking at how you are, look, how you are facing your recovery needs. Um, it's one of those things, recovery is one of those things where uh, it's not like a snowball that rolls down a hill. It's like stepping off a cliff. Uh, recovery is one of those things if you ignore, all of a sudden you're at the bottom of a chasm. Uh, number four, your programming and your planning are your first defense against overtraining. 
And we're going to come back to that in a few points in just a minute. I'm going to give you a couple examples of people that I think have gotten it right. Um, number five, you've got to have protein and you've got to have the essential fats. Um, we all know on, on the fat loss sign, side of things, uh, and you hear this cliche a lot, you can't outrun a donut, you can't outrun a bagel. Um, well, that's true, but you also can't recover without the right proteins and the right fats. Number six is an interesting one. It's a phrase my daughters and wife use, and I, and I like it a lot. And it's very important. It's FOMO, fear of missing out. Don't. One of the problems with the internet and one of the problems with the way things come at me uh, is that almost daily I'm bombarded by a new magic secret, a new thing. That's the answer to all questions. Uh, magic sleepwear, headgear. Of course, I buy it. I can't help myself. Uh, magic breathing masks, all kinds of things. Because I'm always worried that I'm going to miss out on something. Fear of missing out, according to someone I talked to, has become a bigger stressor for student athletes now than being a student or being an athlete, which is crazy when you think about it. The sense that you're missing something is actually stressful, and it's a big stressor for our young athletes. I remember when I was at Utah State, we were on a bus coming home from a track meet, which basically summarizes Friday and Saturdays throughout my entire existence in the spring and winter at Utah State. And somebody said that Playboy magazine had ranked Utah State as a top 10 party school. And I remember a couple of us, uh, Tarl and I, looked at each other and went, really? What are we missing? And we started thinking about how basically we spent the week as student athletes, the weekend as athletes, and then we came home late, well, depending on how you call it, 2, 3, 4 a.m. on Sunday and missed out on everything. But oddly, that was the first time I'd ever picked up on it because I wasn't being constantly bombarded by the great life that all my classmates were having. Fear of missing out is something that this new generation of strength coaches and coaches and trainers need to deal with that I really didn't have to work with very much. Now, number seven, hot tubs and cold showers. I have always thought, and I still think, that there's magic in hot tubs, and there's magic in, in ice cold showers, and there's even more magic in combining the two. I still think there's value to both. I do. I'll go to my death thinking that. But as I make a little joke sometimes, hot tubs are great, cold showers are great, but it's just as important to drink the water. All your body needs for hydration is water. Make sure you get some in. But I'm not dismissing the value of those two resources. Number eight comes from Dane Miller. It was something he went over with me. Um, it's a very funny little formula. A is upper body work. B is lower body work. C is core work, abdominal wall work, equals D, which is performance. He made an interesting point to me on the phone one time. He said, if you improve your lower body strength, A, almost generally, D, performance goes up. With B, upper body work, if you improve on it, you never know about D. Upper body work doesn't always lead to increases in performance. But he said something important. But here's the key. If you drop C, performance always drops. Abdominal work, core work. So one of the things, and it's going to sound odd because I'm telling some people to do more work, is make sure you have an intelligent balance between your upper, lower, and abdominal work, and that will increase performance. Overdoing upper body work at the expense of lower body work or ab wall work is almost universally a mistake. Number nine is something that pretty much... It's nice to have. <clears throat> it's nice to have a thick wallet or pocketbook. <clears throat> and basically, it's to splurge. Um, I'm a big believer in getting pedicures. Uh, there's a place over here in uh, Murray where, for twenty-five dollars, you get your toenails clipped and cleaned. But they also spend about twenty-five minutes massaging your feet, your ankles, and your calves. Um, now. 
I'm a big believer in the, the health of nail beds because, you know, if you get an infection in a nail bed, it travels to your body. So a pedicure might help you there. But you're getting a massage on your feet, ankle, and calves for $25. This is as good as any other massage I've ever had. So to me, a splurge is a massage, maybe buying a hot tub, setting up an ice bath in your backyard, or what I use is an ice shower. Uh, we have a sauna in our home, um, which is oddly a relatively inexpensive tool. Uh, I've got massage plates in my home where you stand on them, they shake you out. We have a massage bed in my home called a Megan, where you can lay down on it and it rolls up and down your back. What I'm trying to get across is sometimes you need to spend money to help your, your recovery process. Now, since I feel like it's my job to lead in the field of fitness, I spend money on these things. Sometimes I walk away saying that was a good investment. Sometimes I walk away and say, well, I'm never going to see that money again. And finally, number 10, pay attention to those you listen to. If somebody's going to make money by you buying a recovery tool, just sit back for a moment and make sure you remember that. Um, the biggest things in your recovery are sleep. So any splurging you do on the sleep side, a better mattress, better blinds, I think is always worth it. Um, reminding yourself that the body is one piece, your, your, your spiritual, your, your, your soul, your body, your mind, you're all one piece. I think that helps a lot. Now, investing in magic sleepwear, magic tools, that's up to you. But pay attention who you're getting your information from. And I got a little freebie here. And every so often remind yourself of why you don't listen to some people. Uh, that's been the biggest error of my coaching career. And now some quick specifics, okay? This is from a booklet called Resilience. Uh, I, I work with the United States military, and this is something I give them. Sleep is the best recovery tool I know. But the skill of sound sleeping is often overlooked. Although I recommend ZMA, zinc, magnesium, vitamin D, a drink called Calm, which has uh, magnesium in it, fish oil, eye shades, and earplugs to just about every audience I speak to, I still say that one of the biggest things you need to do is practice relaxing. There are CDs, and that's of course, and many of you wouldn't even know what that is, DVDs and downloads that walk you through all this stuff and skills, and I can't comment on all of them. If you go to YouTube now, you can actually get uh, sleep-inducing music. I find practicing sleeping is one of those weird skills that most people need to really master. Um, I'm a huge fan of it. Um, I use Brain.fm. I use One Moment Meditations. And I also have some, some other tools I use to practice sleeping. And about... Every few days, my daughters make fun of me because they found out in the afternoon I spent two hours practicing sleeping. They call it napping. All right. This is from one of my more popular articles, uh, 40 Years, 40 Lessons. And very simply, um, it's, it's this simple. When I put together training programs, I always start with the first principle is do no harm. That's first and foremost. Don't hurt people. That's back to asymmetrical risks. What's the worst I can do? I can hurt you. But then you got to think about this, and, and this is a, maybe a personal one, but uh, I hurt my knee badly uh, my junior year in high school, March 30th, 1974. And um, it wasn't bad training. It was being stupid. And there's a big difference there. Um, but the nice thing was my mom was a stay-at-home mom. My sister came over and helped me out. And within just a few days, I was fine. I started training the day after I got home. And within three weeks, I was back throwing the discus again, setting a personal record within three weeks. So, you know, yay for me. But what you might have missed is that I had my mom and my sister around to help me all day long. Later, when I blew my wrist apart, when my daughters were in, uh, just when they were young, uh, I had to buy shoes that I could uh, slip on, dress shoes to slip on, because neither of them knew how to tie a shoelace. And I couldn't because I had a broken wrist. Uh, and my wife was on the road. So it might, 
you might be able to handle an injury in certain times of your life. Later, you might not be able to technically just handle it. And this third point, plan your training with intelligence and foresight. Train hard, but don't hurt yourself. Let's look at a couple examples on how to do that. This is from John Jesse's brilliant book, Wrestling Physical Condition Encyclopedia. And if you look at the way he sets up a typical week, I, I, I just can't, I, I just want to applaud. Three sessions a week of strength development and injury prevention with, with, with heavy loads. Three sessions, sessions a week of flexibility exercises. Three sessions a week of endurance. In the strength development, injury prevention work and flexibility exercises should be one day a week. And the endurance work the other three days. Um, he believed that really, and I've highlighted that in red for you, we're looking at an hour, hour and a half a session here. This is not a ridiculously long amount of time. But what it shows you here is the brilliance of planning workouts before you just go in willy-nilly and just try to crush them. And finally, one of my favorite writers and lifters of all time, and one of my heroes, Tommy Kono, who passed away just a few years ago, a uh, brilliant man, uh, in his book, Weightlifting Olympic Style, he tells us this. The U.S. lifters have to go back to the American system of training and not follow what the Europeans are doing. The lifters must return to basics and not have tonnage or intensity govern their training. Believe it or not, it is the old system of light, medium, heavy training three to four times a week and each workout lasting no more than 90 minutes. It's a matter of taxing your muscles and giving ample time to recover. Too many of our current lifters are overtrained and getting injuries because they lack the recovery time. That's uh, brilliant. And that sums what we're talking about perfectly. Thank you so much.